Welcome to part four of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Measuring Urban Heat Islands and Constructing Heat Vulnerability Indices. In the fourth and final part of the webinar series, we'll be hearing from guest presenter, Dr. Kaski Duholski, who will present on using high-resolution, satellite-derived, hot, humid heat estimates and gridded population data to map extreme heat exposure worldwide. In the first part of the webinar series, we presented on assessing the surface urban heat island derived from land surface temperature data using NASA Earth observations. In the second and third parts of the training, we presented on heat vulnerability indices, why they are important, and how to construct them for your urban area of interest. In this concluding part of the webinar series, we'll be presenting on mapping extreme heat exposure. All webinar recordings, presentations, code, question and answer documents, and homework assignment can be accessed from the training page at the link below. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for this webinar series due by August 25th. Answers must be submitted following the instructions found on the training page. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of August 25th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. After participating, participating in today's training, attendees will be able to define the wet bulb globe temperature and how it is a measure of heat stress, discuss the global high resolution daily extreme urban heat exposure data set, and how it is used with socioeconomic data for understanding exposure and demonstrate the use of Python Jupyter Notebook for assessing extreme urban heat exposure. It is now my pleasure to hand the presentation over to our guest presenter, Dr. Cascade Tuholsky, to present on mapping extreme heat exposure. Cascade, over to you. Hello, and thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Cascade Tuholsky. I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at the Columbia Climate School at Columbia University. This fall, I'll be beginning as an assistant professor in the Earth Sciences Department at Montana State University. I'm a human environmental geographer, and my research focuses on the intersection of extreme heat, exposure, climate change, and food security. Broadly, my goals are to inform adaptation strategies that redu reduce the harmful and inequitable impacts of extreme heat. I completed my PhD from UC Santa Barbara in 2020. Today, I will overview two data sets that I developed with uh, CSEN and NASA CDAC that are released uh, for public use. And I will overview our learning objectives for those data sets. The first learning objective is to define wet bulb globe temperature and how it is used to measure heat stress. Next, I will discuss the global high resolution daily extreme urban heat exposure data set and how we can use it to explore socioeconomic data, largely demographic data, to understand how extreme heat exposure in cities worldwide has changed. Finally, I will demonstrate use of these data sets in a Python Jupyter notebook, as well as some exploratory analysis in QGIS. So, to overview my presentation, the first part of this talk will discuss wet bulb globe temperature. Next, I will provide again an overview of the global high resolution daily extreme urban heat exposure data set, which is from 1983 to 2016. Then I will briefly overview an annual global high resolution extreme heat estimates version one, which will be released this month by NASA CDAC. I will do a Jupyter notebook and QGIS demonstration, and then we will open it up for questions. Uh, an answer session. So throughout this RSED training, you've probably become familiar with land surface temperature. Land surface temperature is measured by many Earth observation platforms, including MODIS and Landsat, and it is a measure of the radiated heat off the surface. But humans don't live exactly on the surface of the planet, but rather one or two meters above as such, land surface temperature can vary greatly over short distances and short time spans. You can time spans. You can think about this as in standing in a grassy field next to a parking lot. If you put your hand on the grass, the grass will be relatively cool compared to touching the asphalt. Now, for us humans, in terms of human health and well-being, 
the radiated heat does influence our lived experience, but air temperature, specifically two meter air temperature, is a much better indicator of heat stress that can affect our health and well being. Or, in other words, heat stress is much more complex than just land surface temperature alone. You have the differences between indoor and outdoor air temperature, uh, the influences of wind speed, relative humidity, whether you're in shade and um, many other climatological factors. And this again is difficult, or this can be difficult to measure with a satellite alone um, if you're just looking at land surface temperature. One metric used largely by uh, physiologists uh, and the public health community is called wet bulb globe temperature. Wet bulb globe temperature is typically measured with a field instrument so on the ground, and it accounts for two meter air temperature, relative humidity, radiated heat, so your land surface temperature, and wind speeds or air flows. Wet bulb globe temperature is, uh, when it's calculated with an instrument, 70% of it is the natural wick temperature. So this is the temperature of wetted cotton that is covered in shade, plus the temperature of a black globe, to measure the radiated heat. So basically the temperature of a black ball being exposed and then the air temperature not exposed. It is important to note that wet bulb globe temperature and wet bulb temperature, both used widely in academia as well as in uh, policymaker spheres are two different metrics um, that require different uh, parameterizations and they should not be confused because say a 30 degree C of wet bulb globe temperature is much different than 30 degree C of wet bulb temperature. To overview the history of wet bulb globe temperature, it was created in the 1950s by the United States Marine Corps, and it was used to estimate heat stress and heat load among uh, Marines who you know, tend to be younger and fit people. And then it evolved into a reference for occupational heat health standards uh, used by the International Standards Organization. Um, and it's widely used in occupational heat health as well as um, in, by different athletic bodies to govern when sport, sporting events should be canceled. Wet bulb globe temperatures are usually referenced for both acclimated and not acclimated folks and different metabolic rates to come up with thresholds when activities should be stopped or when resting should be implemented to reduce the impacts of extreme hot human heat on human health and well-being. Uh, again, the International Standards Organization ISO reference 7243 is often cited, uh, both again in the academic literature and by policymakers for thresholds that are dangerous to human health and well-being. And I want to emphasize that these thresholds were designed for, quote unquote, the working man, generally young, fit, healthy American Marines, who are not the vast majority of people who are at most risk for heat stress. I say this because for most people, especially those who have pre-existing conditions or from vulnerable populations, lower thresholds may be more appropriate to identify dangerous breaking points or thresholds that cause uh, damage to human health and well-being. Now, I said that wet bulb globe temperature typically is measured by a field instrument. Many different scientific teams have come up with ways to estimate wet bulb globe temperature through Earth um, satellite-borne Earth observation platforms, um, as well as uh, climate reanalysis data products. Like I said, there are several different methodologies for calculating wet bulb globe temperature with meteorological data. This paper from Kong and Huber is a great overview. It was in Earth's Future. It was published in January 22, and I highly recommend giving it a detailed reading if you'd like more information about different ways to parameterize wet bulb globe temperature. I will present one way in which you can present or you can calculate wet bulb globe temperature with uh, different gridded meteorological products. The challenge here is that most of the planet and most people on the planet don't live in an area that has a weather station with a longitudinal reporting record. This paper I published with Ben Zychek of Johns Hopkins University in 2021, we found that approximately 4 billion people on the planet 
live more than 25 kilometers away from a weather station with a robust longitudinal, longitudinal reporting record. Half of these people can be classified as urban residents. So this means that Earth observation satellites are really important for not just understanding extreme heat impact in cities today, but also how extreme heat has changed over time and what extreme heat may look like for urban residents worldwide under a warmer climate. So for example, in India, there are approximately 3,000 urban settlements, but only 111 have longitudinal weather stations. Again, to reemphasize this point that Earth observations are key for monitoring, assessing historical change, and predicting future uh, extreme heat stress under climate change, as well as short-term and seasonal forecasting. So this figure right here, the pink and purple dots are where there are weather stations, and the green dots are rough estimations of where there are urban settlements. Um, it's not just for India, but all for, uh, for all of Southern Asia here. And you can see there are far fewer weather stations than there are urban settlements. As I said, satellite data combined with station data can gap fill areas where we lack temperature data or meteorological data to approximate wet bulb globe temperature. In this data set that I'm going to present today, I use TRIPS Daily, which is a new data set from the UC Santa Barbara Climate Hazard Center, and it's been shown to be the most accurate and highest resolution daily global temperature product available from 1983 to 2016. It's available at approximately five by five kilometer grid cells, and it will be updated to near present time sometime probably in early 2023. Right now, the data set only goes to 2016. Church daily advantage is that it leverages the temporal accuracy of station with the spatial coverage of meteorological satellites. The DOI for the raw church data is at the bottom of this slide. And right here is um, a figure from a paper I published where we compare uh, the church daily station extreme heat reporting record with the Princeton Global Enforcing data set, which is another gridded uh, meteorological data set, and we have much better accuracy with our derived temperature data set against stations than this other data set. The same is true for ERA 5 climate reanalysis product. Church Daily outperforms that for measuring extreme heat. To convert Church Daily into wet bulb globe temperature to produce the global high resolution daily extreme heat, extreme urban heat exposure data set, or UHE daily data set, we first take the church daily maximum daily temperature record. So this is a daily temperature record from 1983 to 2016 with near global coverage. We then also use a derived daily minimum relative humidity uh, estimate. And we follow the National Weather Service procedure to turn that into a daily heat index uh, value, which is what uh, we use in the United States to look at hot, humid heat or kind of what it feels like. Then, following this paper, Bernard and Etiendo, pardon for the mispronunciation, 2015, we convert daily heat index to daily wet bulb globe temperature. It's important to note that this is an approximated wet bulb globe temperature estimation covering a range of relative humidity estimates but with fixed wind speed and radiation. So again, it is very much an approximated wet bulb globe temperature, but it can be tied back to those ISO standards so we can get a fairly good understanding, again, of global coverage of how hot human heat stress has changed over the surface of the planet. To build the UHE daily data set, we combine the church daily wet bulb globe maximum record with the global human settlement layer urban center database. The global human settlement layer urban center database is a remote sense derived estimate of how many people live in urban settlements for the whole planet, benchmarked at 1975, 1990, 2000, 2010, and I believe now 2020 with the latest data release. What's cool about this data set is we have a fairly good understanding of not just how many people live in cities across the planet over about a 40 year period, but also how big those cities are. With this, we can calculate the area average daily 
maximum wet bulb globe temperature for each urban settlement on the planet for a 34 year period. This yielded about 150 million daily observations. And then we can apply the ISO threshold to identify how many days for each city on the planet exceeded a dangerous heat threshold. So for example, wet bulb globe temperature of 30, how many days did each city on the planet for this time period exceed that threshold? So the graph, or pardon me, the graphic on my screen right here shows uh, loosely our methods. We take a church daily wet bulb globe temperature maximum uh, record. We overlay the global human settlement layer urban center database. We turn that into a raster, and then we calculate the area average wet bulb globe temperature data set um, for every day. And then we identify which days exceeded a dangerous uh, extreme heat threshold. This area right here is for the Nile River Valley. And you can see uh, loosely in the bottom right that it goes from white, white to blue, meaning that the Southern Nile area had more hot humid days than the northern region, which makes sense given that it gets warmer as you get closer into the Sahara. To measure exposure, we use an established metric called person days. This metric takes the number of hot humid days in a given year and multiplies it by the population exposed. We can do this for any geography. So for New York City, hypothetically speaking, we could say, that there are 10 million people in New York City. And in 2016, there were two dangerous hot humid days. Thus, there would be 20 million person days for 2016 for New York City. We can then look at how person days has changed through time and fit a trend line to that. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And once we fit the trend line, we can look at the average rate of change in exposure. So basically, how hot is a city getting and how many more people are being exposed for a given year. These are results from a paper we published in PNAS last year, and this kind of goes through in more detail at the global level how urban extreme heat exposure has changed over time. We found that approximately extreme urban heat exposure increased 200% from 1983 to 2016, and total urban warming contributed a third of the annual rate of increase in exposure. So in this figure, the yellow line represents the total increase in person days per year. The blue line is the trend due to population growth alone, and the purple line is the trend due to urban warming. It's very important to note in this data set that urban warming is both a combination of climate change and the urban heat island effect. We do not back out the impact of the urban heat island effect versus climate change in this data set. You'll note that the slope of the purple line plus the slope of the blue line equals the slope of the yellow line. So we can see whether for a given city or a given geography, whether exposure was driven by more people moving to a city or by the city warming up in itself, which is true for most of Europe, European cities don't tend to be increasing in population, but they are warming. But for much of the rest of the planet, it's a combination of both population change and increased warming. So like I said, we can disaggregate this data set for every city on the planet. And I'll show this in my demonstration, what this looks like programmatically. But here we show the annual rate of change in person days from 19 83 to 2016, we find that 6,000 urban settlements had an increase in exposure, which housed 1.7 billion people in 2016. You'll see that those cities with the greatest increase in person days really concentrate at the mid and low latitudes. With this data set, like I said, we can also estimate whether for a given geography, the increase in exposure is driven by population growth or by warming and you'll see that some cities, it's a combination of two or it's equal. I will note with this graph that white and purple dots are plotted over green dots, and there's far more green dots than white and purple dots, meaning for many places on the planet, even with global warming, people are moving to cities and thus exposure is increasing. We can also look at this data set at just the warming signal. So we can ask the question for a given city, how much hotter is it in, or in 2016 
than it was in 1983? And what is the annual average rate of change for dangerous hot humid heat? I should note here that all the data I'm presenting right now uses a wet bulb globe temperature daily th maximum threshold of 30 C. The data set also has it estimated for 28 C and 32 C, and I'll show you that mo uh, momentarily in the demonstration. What's really interesting to me about this data set is we can dive into very localized heterogeneous patterns. Even though this data set was developed with a very top-down approach, it's very locally applicable. So here we have three large South Asian cities, Kolkata, Delhi, and Dhaka. And on the X or on the Y axis, we have days per year where the wet bulb globe temperature exceeded 30 C. On the Y axis, we, or pardon me, on the X axis, we have time. You can see that Kolkata tends to be on average hotter and humider than Delhi and Dhaka, and that its rate of change is greater than Delhi and Dhaka in terms of the number of hot, humid days in 2016 versus 1983. So this data set, the Global High Resolution Daily Extreme Urban Heat Exposure Data Set, UHE Daily, is available from the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, or CDAC. It is live right now. Um, you can Google it, or you could just jump on uh, NASA CDAC and find it right now if you just type in urban heat. I'll put the DOI up in a second. Um, it includes every hot, humid heat wave. So not just how many days per year, but when each heat wave was based on these criteria, how hot the heat wave was um, and how long it lasted for three different ISO extreme heat thresholds, wet bulb glow max 28, 30, and 32. It also includes annual person day estimates or exposure estimates for each urban settlements, plus exposure and warming, uh, warming trends. The data set is available in GeoJSON, CSV, and shapefile formats. Here's the DOI for the data set. The second data set that will be released by NASA CDAC this month is the annual global high resolution extreme heat estimates version one. This data set is very similar, except for it only focuses on the rate of warming and it's not just focused on urban areas. I'll show you in a moment what I mean by that. So right now we have the time series of the number of days per year where wet bulb globe maximum exceeded 28 C um, and the locations on the planet where that happened. And you'll see for a given year, some areas might be yellow signifying that wet bulb glow maximum exceeded 28 C for say 300 days. Darker areas might be less. This data set is available uh, with 34 GeoTIFF files and we also have the annual rate of change calculated too. And in my demonstration, I will show you what I mean by that. So again, the annual global high resolution extreme heat estimate data set to be released by NASA CDAC. This will be the DO DOI, it's not uh, activated right now, but it should be by the time uh, this presentation is given. It's similar to the UHE daily. It's the global annual count number of days at five kilometers across these three set thresholds, and it also has the rate of change. So right now we have the or this figure right here, we have the Arabian Peninsula, a pink pixel increased on average 2.5 days per year from 1983 to nine. Uh, to 2016, where the wet bulb globe maximum temperature exceeded 32 C. A green pixel is half a day. So a green pixel, half a day per year over 34 years, is about 17 days more of hot, humid heat, dangerous hot, humid heat in 2016 than in 1983. The blue areas here represent urban boundaries, and I'll show in my demonstration how you can approximate a hot, humid, urban heat island effect. And you can dive into an urban area and calculate how much more did this urban area heat up than its surrounded, uh, surrounding rural area. And that gives us an indication of how much the urban built environment might be driving our increase in dangerous hot humid heat for a given geography. So now I'm gonna launch into a demonstration. So this is the National Socioeconomic Data and uh, NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center website. I've navigated to uh, the UHE daily data set. Here's a descriptor of it. The data set download. Takes a moment, my internet is a little slow today. 
Um, but this should load right up. And you can download it in tabular CSV, JSON, or shape files. The documentation page leads to a full description of our methods in our PNAS publication, uh, as well as metadata. I have already downloaded the data set. Here is what the files will look like. You have these different thresholds. Um, and if we go into, here is uh, the data set. So now to look at this in a Jupyter Notebook, we can start loading the data. This uh, data set is available, or pardon me, this notebook is available on GitHub. And I think I can pull it up right now. Just so you see where it is in GitHub. It's in this notebooks and it's this NASA R set tutorial for later use. Also feel free to send me an email and I can send you the Jupyter Notebook. So these are the dependencies you will need. You'll need pandas, geopandas, numpy, os, uh, matlib, plot, pyplot, and seaborn to uh, make this notebook work. The first thing I do is, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I set the file path and I set the data set. This string, wet ball globe temperature max 30, will be common throughout, so it makes it really easy to just change part of your code to load, say, the 28 threshold or the 32 threshold. So I set the data set and the path. And the first thing we're going to look at is the annual rate of ex uh, the annual exposure. So this is the person days for a given year. This is identified with this exp uh, suffix. So I'll load the data and I'll show you what it looks like. So right here, you have a unique identifier that maps back to the Global Human Settlement Urban Center database, the year, the total days that exceeded wet bulb globe temperature 30, the estimated population, the population in 1983, the population in 2016, the person days, the person days heat, person days pop, and then some geographic information. So, in 2016, there were two hot days for this city. The population was approximately 600,000 people. So our, per, our person days is two times 2016. And then we can back out the contribution from people population versus warming. We can also look at uh, the data set through an English language name search based on geography. So with this code cell, we're going to subset the exposure data set for India only. And we see, you know, here is a, a city in 1983. It had 81 days. The population was approximately 250,000 people. It's uh, Euchre, pardon me for the mispronunciation, India. Here's the Latin long if you want to plot it and some auxiliary geographic information. And we can also do a search uh, based on city names. So here I'm going to look for Kolkata based on this string K-O-L-K -K, and see if I can find the data for Kolkata. And so here is the exposure record from 1983 to 2016 for Kolkata. Again, here are the hot humid days or days that exceeded wet bulb globe temperature of 30 the population um, of the city in the given year, um, and then the person days. And then we can plot, um, we can plot this data to see how exposure has changed, which is similar to some of the graphs I showed in my presentation. So I'm subsetting the data here based on the ID. And now this is all the data for Kolkata. And we can look at how, uh, Ex annual exposure or person days change for Kolkata from 1983 to 2016. So here, each bar represents the total exp exposure. Again, that's hot human days multiplied by the number of people expo exposed, and then the increase for Kolkata over the time frame of the data set. We can also ask the question, as I said, what is a contribution to total exposure from warming versus population growth? And here we subset the three data sets. Person days is total, people days heat is a contribution from uh, heating, and people days pop is a con contribution to person days um, from population growth. And so here's our graph. 
And we can see that in Kolkata, a lot of uh, the green areas is the contribution to this very light pink. Let's change that a little bit to 0.2. There we go, see it a little better. So here we have the increase in exposure due to heat in green due to population change in blue and the increase, the total, the blue plus the green equals uh, the red. And we can see that in Kolkata, a huge part of the signal, and we discussed this in the PNAS paper, um, in terms of total exposure is driven by an increase in days per year where wet bulb globe temperature exceeds 30. We can also ask how many days per year was wet bulb globe temperature max greater than 30 in Kolkata. This is um, a subset of one of the graphs in my presentation. And you do this by pulling the total days column from the data set. And here are the count number of days where wet bulb globe temperature exceeded 30 um, for Kolkata from 1983 to 2016. So next in the data set, we can also ask, what was the rate of change? Basically, how much per year did exposure change and how much of that exposure was driven by population change or by increased heating? Again, this is a rate of change. And we use this by using the data set wet bulb globe max 30 trend P or heat PO5. And so this is um, the increase in hot humid days per year. And we see that our coefficient of total days is 0.48. So about a half a day per year increase is how much uh, the rate of change in hot humid days was for Kolkata using the 30 C threshold. And again, we could uh, subset and search for Kolkata. And, oh, pardon me, this, this initial one is not Kolkata, but then we can subset based on the unique ID for Kolkata. And we can ask this question, pulling the coefficient of total days, and we see that the increase in warming was about 1.8 days per year. And then using Seaborn, we could actually plot that. So we'll take this graph and then we'll plot the trend line across it. And here's our trend line with confident intervals. And the slope of this line is approximately 1.8 days per year. As I said in the beginning of uh, the introduction of the data set, we also all have the individual heat waves along the statistics for those heat waves based on those thresholds. Um, I wanna emphasize that there is no universal definition for what constitutes a heat wave, and it really comes down to the local context to define them. But with a global data set, we decided to use a globally um, accepted standard to define what was a hot humid day. Um, but again, I want to emphasize for different locales, um, practitioners and researchers should identify the appropriate threshold for them. Um, so this is a really big data set because again, it's every heat wave. So it takes a moment to load in. Um, but once it's loaded, it will come up on the screen and I can walk through um, some different research questions we can ask of the data set. So one moment while this loads. So there it goes, it loads. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right here. Again, I subset the data based on this 9691 identifier for Kolkata. And this is what the heat wave data set looks like. So you have your uh, city ID, the year of the heat wave, the duration of the heat wave, the average wet bulb globe temperature, the average intensity. So that's, you can think of that as excessive heat. So how much was 30 degrees exceeded on average? The total t intensity is the summation of all the excess heat based on that threshold. We have the event dates, um, the intensity, um, a unique identifier for each heat wave, and then the auxiliary um, information. So right now, this is every heat wave, um, that, well, it's just the first couple, but every heat wave based on the threshold, um, consecutive days where um, wet bulb globe temperature exceeded 30 C for Kolkata. So we can ask some nice questions. Um, we can subset this for heat waves from 1983 um, that exceeded wet bulb globe temperature of 30 for Kolkata that lasted more than 30 days. 
So we subset that and then we're going to ask, well, how many heat waves were there that exceeded 30 days in Kolkata over this time period? There were 10. Um, we can ask what years did these heat waves happen? We're 1989, uh, 96, 99, 2000, 2005, 2008, 2010, 2012, 2015, 2013. We can also uh, look at in the event IDs if we want to just gather all of them and keep track of them based on a unique identifier. Um, so this is uh, the event ID of uh, a certain heat wave from 2016 where the duration of the heat wave was greater than uh, 30 days. And we can look at that. Oh, pardon me, this is an old set of code. Just change this really quickly. I was looking for 50 day ones. So here's your heat wave. Um, so we see again that it was in 2016, it lasted 31 days. Here are the dates, and the intensity, and we can even look at, you know, all the dates that this heat wave happened. Um, I highly recommend if you're going to be using the heat wave data set, and again, the file name for the heat wave data set is, um, pardon me, I scrolled too far up. The file name is the stats um, suffix for the data set. So if you're using this to use the JSON files, because this JSONs will allow you to read these lists. Otherwise they get loaded in as strings and you have to parse them yourself. So again, I really recommend using the JSON version, not the CSV or the shape files, if you're interested in looking at individual heat waves. Again, this is for 13,000 cities, not just Kolkata. Um, so we can also subset this into a data frame. So here is um, our dates of extreme heat in 2016 uh, that for this one giant heat wave and then the temperatures for each data set. So the last thing I'll show you is the, um, the trend in exposure. So we can look at which cities have the highest rate of increase in person day exposure over time. And that's with this trends P days at 0.05 and we'll load this into here and again we see our coefficient um, of person days so this is the increase in person days per year this is the p-value so we see it's this statistical significance and we can sort them um, based on this coefficient of p days and we can rename the columns to something a little nicer all the column names are well described in the readme files that come with these data sets um, but also again this code is publicly available and we make a nice data frame here where we have the id we have the exposure trend the days per year increase the city um, the populations at different time points. And these are the way this uh, code is written. These are ranked ordered. So we see Dhaka, Delhi, Kolkata, Bangkok, Mumbai, Karachi um, are our top ranked cities in terms of uh, global increase in extreme heat exposure from 1983 to 2016. Now, very briefly, I'm going to go to QGIS so we can look at this new data set I'm developing that again will be released this month. It may be fully released by the time the seminar is live. Right now I have QGS, I have the OpenStreetMap platform open, and I have uh, the wet bulb globe temp, I'm gonna turn this off, count days for the year 2000. So here we have them listed, black areas are zero, Bright yellow is 365 days that exceeded a wet bulb globe temperature of the year 2000. This is global. We can overlay 30, and as we would expect, fewer parts of the planet have you know days that exceed a wet bulb globe temp of 30, and even fewer have an increase of, uh, or pardon me, count number of days per year where a wet bulb globe temperature maximum exceeded 32. Zoom in here, and we see this is largely in the Persian Gulf region and parts of uh, Southern Asia. These rasters are available again from 1983 to 2016. I just have some of them loaded, but if we zoom back out to the global level, this is our count number of days per year in 2016. And then I'll put the 
that exceeded 30C, and this is 2000. So you can see globally very quickly that 2016 was a much hotter day for almost, well, a huge part of the planet. Pardon me. 2016 was a much hotter year than 2000 for much of the planet in terms of dangerous, hot, humid heat. We also have the trends, and this is statistically significant and 0.05, and this is what that figure was um, shown in my presentation. So the white areas are um, five kilometer grid cells that increased by about a half a day per year where wet bulb globe temperature, or days per year where wet bulb globe temperature max exceeded 28 degrees. Pink is six days per year. Six day per year increase means that some of these locations are saturating where every day now exceeds a wet bulb globe temperature maximum of 28 degrees. This is what it looks like, the trend line looks like for 30 degrees. You'll see some interesting things that um, I'm excited to dive into. This region right here actually shows that wet bulb globe temperature days per year may be going down. And I think this might be have to do with a drying signal because again, wet bulb globe temperature is a combination of humidity and temperature. So temperatures may still be going up, but hot humid temperatures might be decreasing in this region. But in general, we see that wet bulb globe temperatures increased um, for a lot of mid latitude and low latitude locations on the planet. Um, and then again, at the wet bulb globe temperature of 32 degrees. So I'm going to just zoom in on, um, or just present a few things you can do. So you can ingest a shape file. Um, so these are national boundaries. This is a boundary of India. And then using the raster extraction, you can clip your raster um, by a masked layer. So I'm not actually going to do this, but so this is wet bulb globe temperature of 30. And here's our masked layer. Where's our India boundary? Here's our India boundary. And if I hit run, it will produce a subset just for India. And I have already done that. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So here's our subset for India. Um, the colors haven't been changed, but we can zoom in on that. And that's what it looks like for India. So we just isolated the wet bulb globe temperature 30 trend for India. Um, and we can also do this. Um, like I said, you could take one of these and look at the change of an urban versus a surrounding ur uh, rural area. So I changed the colors here so, uh, so they pop a little bit more, but we're going to zoom in on the Miami or the western southwestern coast of Florida. Here is where uh, Miami and Fort Lauderdale are. You can overlay uh, a boundary file of urban centers. Um, so I'll turn that off. So this is the rough uh, land surface area of Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. I've isolated that polygon here. And then I buffered it using, uh, again, a QGIS. So if you go to vector and you go to processing tools and you go to buffer, and um, this is uh, in degrees. So approximately 0.1 is a 10 kilometer buffer around it. And then you can take the difference in that buffer and see, okay, so this is our rough surrounding 10 kilometer buffer around uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. And then you can clip your rasters. Um, oops, pardon me. So that's your surrounding buffer. Uh, I haven't changed the colors. So that's your approximately, you know, your 10 km rural area. And that's with the urban uh, center. And so you could come up with the average wet bulb globe temperature increase for your rural area versus your urban area. And that would give you an approximation of your wet bulb globe temperature impact of the urban heat island of a surrounding area. But again, if you just visually look at Miami, you can see these pink areas are increasing at 1.5, or pardon me, 1.25, and purple areas are one day per year. The green areas are inland, much more rural areas where you see much less impact of extreme heating. Now, I'm not going to say whether this was all urban heat island effect or climate change. These are very complex processes, but the cool thing about this data set is it will at least give you a general understanding of how urban versus rural areas are heating up at the global scale, and I tried to make it as simple and usable as possible. So with that, I'm gonna end my demonstration and I'm gonna pass it off uh, back to Sean. Um,
and here are my references. And with that, I thank you for being here and I open it up for question and answers and pass this on to uh, back to the administrators. Thank you, Cascade, for the wonderful presentation and demonstration. We've received a number of questions from participants, and for those online who would like to ask a question to Dr. Tucholsky, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the Q&A document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact information for Dr. Tucholsky, along with links to the training page and the RSET website. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. We appreciate your attention and please submit your questions if you haven't already. We will get through as many as possible in the time remaining. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you for everybody that have been contributing your questions. We've gotten uh, quite a few already, and uh, they're all very good. So if you have any, please do feel free. We still have plenty of time left, roughly 45 minutes uh, today in this final part of the webinar series on urban heat islands and extreme heat. So again, we do encourage, if you have questions, please do submit them. Uh, jumping into question number one, uh, what is the difference between wet bulb globe temperature and wet bulb temperature. How is wet bulb temperature measured and used? Uh, Cascade, over to you if you want to unmute to answer that. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we sure can. Excellent. So I started answering a bit of this in the text, um, but basically wet bulb temperature is uh, the temperature at which um, uh, you don't get any evaporative cooling from uh, increased moisture. So basically, uh, any water can't, uh, basically it's the temperature at which relative humidity is equal to 100% and uh, under given conditions. And it is commonly used with climate reanalysis products um, because it's easy, well, relatively easy to parameterize from it. I believe what goes into it is your saturation, vapor pressure, and your air temperature. Wet bulb globe temperature, as I said in the talk, is much more a field instrument measurement that incorporates wind speed and an attempt for radiated heat, whereas wet bulb temperature does not have that as a parameterization. Um, and they're really two different metrics um, used by different communities. And I don't think one is per se uh, more informative or less important either. I think they're both fairly valuable. The important thing is just not to confuse them because they're both cent and Celsius. So wet bulb temperature of 30 and wet bulb globe temperature of 30 are not equal. And sometimes, um, even myself, I'll mix them up um, just when I'm speaking because they're very similar names, but they're, they're, they're two different metrics. Wonderful, thank you, Cascade, great. Uh, moving on to question number two. The health burden of heat varies by climate region, population characteristics, and adaptation capacity. Are you not generalizing too much when you use one same threshold for the entire globe? What is a hot day for Alaska may not be in Tanzania, for example. Yeah, and that's, you know, when we wrote this paper, that was what we uh, wrestled with in our initial analysis is how do we do a global scale comparative analysis that is fairly straightforward, but also make it generalizable for any, uh, pardon me, make it specific enough for any local context. So we arrived at least for the initial analysis at using three different wet bulb globe temperatures based on international standards organization criteria. But as I said in the start of my talk, those criteria are really based on a, a old, you know, studies that are over 50 years old based on a very homogeneous population. And I think that um, a more detailed analysis for different geographies really need to incorporate that place-based analysis. So perhaps, perhaps for um, you know, researchers or stakeholders in northern latitudes, the wet bulb globe temperature of 28 still isn't even a, uh, applicable. And I hope with further releases, we can dive into some more locally um, specific data sets and create them um, as needed for groups around the planet. But yeah, I, I fully agree with that point. It's really hard to come up with generalizable extreme heat thresholds. Great, thank you again, Cascade. Uh, moving on to question number three, 
how can we use urban heat exposure uh, daily data set on a neighborhood scale? Which scale best fits use this methodology? So um, a couple of points. In terms of historical data sets, um, until actually I think last week a new data set came out that might be global at one kilometer from the year 2000. But in general, five kilometer is the highest resolution. Um, Church Daily is the highest resolution temperature record produced with the kind of accuracy that it uh, yields. And so the UHE data set cannot be used for neighborhood scale analysis. It's really to intercompare different urban settlements. And I'm very cognizant, especially as a geographer, that the word urban means many different things in many different places. So comparing, you know, the the area average temperature of Cairo to Helena, Montana is just, it's not necessarily the best metric. And that's why we produce the second data set with just the actual count days per hot days at the raster level so that researchers can identify the geographies of interest for themselves. And five kilometers does allow for some neighborhood scale analysis. We've actually been working on um, some urban heat island, hot, humid urban heat island mapping of New York City. And it does delineate um, pretty well between the boroughs and um, some general uh, neighborhood characteristics. But to my knowledge, you're not going to find, you know, like a 30 meter hot, humid uh, data set that goes back into the 1980s, unfortunately. We just don't uh, didn't have the capacity to produce data sets like that that uh, long ago. Great. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. And getting back to, if you remember from part one of this webinar series, when we discussed some of the limitations of satellite remote sensing and derived products, uh, it's very difficult to have very high resolutions in both temporal and spatial. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing that now. So it's really a compromise on using uh, the highest resolution for your application. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully whoever asked that will be able to, to find a happy medium. So moving on, question number four, is there a particular reason on the 28C benchmark for the days per year, wet bulb globe temperature max on page 27? Yeah. I. Um... As I said earlier, and I put the link into the, a really nice paper because the ISO standards are actually not open source. So that's a nice link to a paper where you can go read about the ISO standards or if you go into Google Scholar and type in the wet bulb globe temperature ISO standards, it'll give you an overview of the history. And there's lots and lots and lots of critiques. There's um, the paper I presented or had a screenshot of, um, I think it's a Kong and Hoover paper. Um, critiques different um, ways to calculate wet bulb globe temperature from satellite observations or climate reanalysis products. And so just to get to your question, 28 is um, follows ISO standard for, um, I believe, unacclimated people working under moderate uh, stress. And so that's, uh, we figured that was, uh, or we decided that was gonna be the lowest end of this data set. Um, however, like I said, we're very cognizant that that may be too hot um, to really understand extreme hot humid heat stress, especially in northern latitudes or southern latitude uh, areas. Great, thanks Cascade. Um, question number five, when should we use land surface temperature or wet bulb globe temperature to create heat maps? Oh, I don't want to get in trouble with my colleagues here. Um, so I will give you a broad answer and not get into specific. I think um, many of the heat health scholars, both from the public health side, but also the remote sensing side, um, I work with have pointed out that land surface temperature does offer um, a good understanding at a very fine spatial and temporal resolution of how heat burden may vary across a given urban area, you know, from building to building. The problem with land surface temperature, as has been discussed in this, is it um, it's not what we actually experience as humans, that a parcel of air, you know, as you're walking around through a city, it does change fairly significant between neighborhoods but not at the way that a satellite will read land surface temperature between, as I presented, asphalt and grass, literally right next to each other, you can have a huge temperature difference. So to your question, I would say you should use land surface temperature 
um, if you want a high understanding of how land surface temperature varies across a given geographer, geography with the understanding that it does not necessarily reflect heat health burden or impacts to human livelihood, as well as say um, a derived wet bulb globe temperature that I present here, which may not provide the spatial resolution, but is, I would say, better connected to heat health outcomes. Again, with the caveat that we're using very broad breast thresholds with this data set. Great, I like how you worded that cascade. You definitely don't don't want to cross paths with any colleagues that are, are, are preferenced one over the other. Um, question number six, how do we complement satellite derived land surface temperature and wet bulb globe temperature calculated from gridded daily temperature and humidity? And how good is the extreme temperature represented in the gridded data, assuming gridded data is interpolated? So the gridded data, so two things. The gridded data is, um, it is a blend of station observations and satellite observations. So um, I'll get into the weeds a little bit. The first step is actually a data set called Church Max, which I was not involved in producing. The Church Map Max at five kilometer grid cell is the uh, monthly maximum temperature. And that really goes through, uh, sorry, it's a double word here, the goes um, and the various meteorological satellite record. And it fully, uh, I think it's called the grid sat record, and they fully remove all cloud screening data, uh, data from there. And they blend it with stas station observations using uh, the church algorithm. To come up with the mean max, or pardon me, the monthly maximum temperature, and then we use that monthly maximum temperature to bias correct downscaled era five. So basically, on a given day in era five, uh, we subtract the difference between the the average of the maximum temperatures for era five from the church uh, max monthly maximum temperature. So in short, it's not interpolated at all. It's actually um, adjusted using satellite, basically we're adjusting Air 5 using satellite and station observations to produce the higher resolution data. Um, and I'll put the the paper you wanna look up, um, I'll, I'll uh, make sure the link gets up for the Church Max data set so you can understand in detail how that data set is produced. Terrific, thanks Cascade. Uh, okay, moving on to question number seven. Can we use what was discussed here as an exposure component in formulating our heat vulnerability indices? Um, that's a complex question. I would say you can use this as a framing and you definitely can use uh, the second data set I presented in terms of understanding your temperature signal, but the UHE data set itself is really a broad brush ex population exposure, but it doesn't speak to anything below the city scale in terms of vulnerability. So we can say very general, generally that New York City is a wealthier city than say uh, Cairo. And so, you know, higher exposure levels in New York City may be easier for the government of New York to deal with because they have more money and more infrastructure than Cairo. So in that way, there might be less, there may be more exposure, but less vulnerability. I'm totally speaking off the cuff here. My point being is I don't think that data just said speaks very well to um, anything beyond population level vulnerability for a given urban settlement. The second data set very much so can be uh, tied to any other socioeconomic and demographic data set that's spatially explicit to local vulnerability. And as I said, we're working on that for uh, the city of New York right now, actually. Great, I hope uh, publication comes out of that. I would like to read that once it's, uh, once it's ready for, for the public. Question number eight, how is wet bulb globe temperature and wet bulb temperature different <clears throat> excuse me, from thermal indices such as uh, PET, UTCI, and PT? Um, so I, I only am familiar with the acronym UTCI, and uh, I can put a, a link to a paper that goes, I, I believe somebody just published a paper that goes through like 
200 different heat health metrics. There are a plethora of them. And I, I think, again, last week or two weeks ago, somebody just published where they go through them. So I can't speak to the specifics how wet bulb globe temperatures varies between them. All I can say is that there are many different extreme heat metrics um, and that the research and public health community, I think, is starting to zero in on a few that are um, most broadly applicable to different contexts. But at the same time, again, especially as a geographer, I really respect the importance of place space and locally specific heat health metrics that make the most sense. And with Earth observation platforms, it's often hard to have that, again, broad spatial generalizability. Um, but also the to develop a globally broad data set, but also incorporate that local context. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry I can't fully answer that question. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, question number nine. Uh, these are all been really, really terrific questions coming in. Are there any open source models to predict heat waves and heat stress? Um, I can't. Uh, answer that question either in terms of because I'm not a meteorological forecaster. I don't know if ECWMF or uh, NOAA models are open source. I know that the resulting data sets are, but I don't know about the actual parameterization of the models. I do know that many meteorological models um, are written in uh, like Fortran. And so uh, some of them actually haven't been updated to. Uh, you know, to these modern, more modern programming languages that my generation of researchers are more familiar with. I'm going to call on my colleague, Dr. Amita Mekta, who you heard from uh, in a previous training in part three. Amita, do you know if the GEOS 5 model um, is, uh, can be applied for predicting heat waves and heat stress? Um. Yes, I, the resolution has to be considered, uh, but it, there is, uh, it, it does provide um, a prediction of temperatures and humidity both. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, question number 10, why does the data set stop in 2016? Is the data up to 2016 only, or is it more updated? Um, it's a very simple answer. It's stopped at 2016 due to uh, uh, work, labor availability of the researchers producing the data set. Uh, the cloud screening and developing the underlying climatology from the satellite record was a tremendous undertaking. And that, you know, I think the Church Max data was published in 2019, which means they finish the analysis sometime in 2017, 2018. So that's when their record went through. However, UCSB Climate Hazard Center will be updating all of these data sets to be produced in, uh, I think, with like a month or two lag time. This, hopefully by the end of 2022, if not early 2023, and that's why these data sets are versioned. So hopefully we'll have version two um, out sometime next year. But yeah, the, the goal is to get these data sets so they're um, operationally effective so that stakeholders can use them right away to understand heat stress um, as it's happening in near real time. Great, thank you. Thank you, Cascade. Well, I, I do believe we have gotten through all the questions that were posed today uh, in this part four, final part of the webinar series on assessing urban heat islands and extreme heat. Uh, for everybody that joined us, we hope that you were able to start from uh, the first part all the way through this last, and we thank you. Uh, we know that this is, we hope you got a lot of value from this training, and we hope that a lot of the, uh, the applications that you're able to learn in each part of the four-part training will help you in your own research and help you if you are uh, applying this in your profession. So we, uh, we, you can expect a survey to be sent to you uh, in the next week or two. That survey will uh, ask you questions on some of the things that you, that you learned and, and how well you will uh, apply them in your own work. So we encourage all of you when you receive that survey in the next week or two, 
please do take the time. Uh, it only takes five to 10 minutes, not that long, to complete that survey. We take all of those responses uh, uh, very uh, uh, very well, and we, we apply them to how we plan our future trainings in terms of the topics that we will train on and how we will run future trainings based on the feedback that you're able to give us. So please do take the time to complete that survey when it is sent to you soon. Uh, we want to greatly thank our guest presenter today, Dr. Cascade Tucholsky. Uh, Cascade, thank you so much for joining today and, and providing this wonderful presentation and demonstration in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we hope that people will use the, the Jupyter, the, the code that you wrote in the Jupyter Notebook to be able to apply it in their own area of interest. And we hope that um, uh, we hope that uh, it does get used by, by the participants. So thank you so much for contributing to this, this training. And I also want to thank the entire RSET team that has been supporting this training, uh, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Sarah Kutchall, Jonathan O'Brien, uh, and Brock Blevins, and as well as Amida Mekta. So thank you for the RSET team who contributed to this training. And, and lastly, we do wanna thank all the participants again for joining today. Uh, we do hope that you got a lot of value from this training, and we hope that you will join up on our listserv, on the RSET listserv, to learn about upcoming trainings that might be of interest to you in your research or into your profession. So thank you for everybody again, and we hope you stay safe, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.